Hello everyone, today is Thursday, August 18, 2016, and this is the week in charts. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, let's talk about, we're going to talk about current market conditions, your questions, and of course, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, hang out or hold off until we get to the actual charts before you ask about stocks. Uh, for those of you who are new to show, that is. Uh, and, and don't know how long things work. And then if you don't mind, you can ask about as many tickers as you want, but just put a ticker on a line and then hit the uh, enter or carriage return. That way I can get to them all and make sure that uh, I t once I talk about them, otherwise I might get confused as to which ones I talked about and not. Uh, this week I thought I would talk more on micromanagement. And we have a live example. And last week I was kind of hoping that this uh, – Example would work out as it did, and, and luckily it did, or fortunately it did, I should say. And we'll talk about that in just one second. Uh, this week's Dave Landry's The Week of Charts is brought to you by, once again, it's brought to you by me. And that's a little banner ad for my trading service. We might have a couple of more symbols to add to this little uh, graphic, which is kind of fun. Uh, you can see that at trading service, uh, DaveLandry.com slash trading service. And then I have a low introductory rate. Also, I have a sort of an unadvertised special going on. I mentioned this last week in the show. If you get the stock selection course, I'll give you one year of the trading service for free. So that'll save you $1,500 roughly. Uh, it, it's, it's a good deal, if I say so myself. And the great thing is, it's one thing to talk about things in theory. It's another thing to see them in actual practice. So I'll show you how to pick the best stocks, and then you'll get to see my stock picking over the next year and compare your notes to mine. For many people, that's the that's the, the biggest value is being able to compare your homework to mine. For those of you who are serious about coming becoming a trader completely on your own, you could get to do that. And then I think after a year, you'll say, you know what, Dave, I'm going to keep you on staff because it is good to have somebody else doing that homework too. So I have somebody to compare notes with. Anyway, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now. And then that's stealing a line from my friend Greg Morris. Now, I want to talk more on micromanagement, and Merriam-Webster calls it uh, or defines it as to try to control or manage all the small parts of something, such as an activity, in a way that is usually not wanted or that causes problems. And that's a pretty good definition for trading. But as I said last week, I think a little bit better definition would be trying to outsmart the market by abandoning a simple trading plan. The way I do things, as you know, if you've been around me for a little while, is I try to keep it as simple as possible. So you're abandoning a simple trading plan due to some sort of logic or feelings and it's a propensity to take action when none is needed. And as I often say, you're confusing the issue with facts and allowing the market to teach you badly. Now, last week, we spent a lot of time talking about the market being a bad teacher. And that's something I beat the dead horse on quite often. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that this week, although I'll probably be forced to say something at least. But we'll see. Now, as I often say... And you married guys should be able to attest to this. Either my wife has an overconfidence in me or she underestimates projects. But, and I know I've said this a thousand times, but whenever there's something to do around the house, it's always like all you got to do, all you have to do. And she wanted me to take some hedge trimmers to the front of the property and just zip zip around some bushes in the front. Well, we started doing that and we realized that we would have to cut the bushes way back because we let them go. I don't know, 20 years or so. <laughs> and then before you do it, we decided to just go to a ground zero and I'm trying to pull things out with a truck. And then we realized that we had a big brick post that was leaning. And then the weekend, next weekend, we get a friend over with a truck, uh, a Jeep and a winch and we got winch up the post and all. So and now we've got to replant it all. So what started out as a very simple job turned into something a lot more complex but on the surface all you have to do like like a, a honeydew project around the property it always turns out to be a little bit more complex than it really is but in reality all you have to do with trading is plan your trade and of course trade your plan 
So the question is, is it really all you have to do? And is trading as easy as pie? Well, in my trading service, as a setup back on the 27th, I had a setup for pie, symbol PI. And the entry was 20, so buy the pie. And of course, we could be wrong on any given trade. So we had a stop in pie, a pie stop. And then we're going to take partial profits at 23, in case that's all we get is the partial profits. And hopefully, and I hate to use the word hope, but that's how it works. Hopefully, we'll get much more on that. So let's take a look at a chart and see what that looks like. And so there's your parameters up there for the actual trade. And we did get an entry on the trade. Now, by the end of the day, it wasn't looking so good because the stock came back in. But as I often say, a lot of times trades will go against you. And they can be perfectly good trades. I don't want to digress too far into that. Let's get a, right, a good pointer on here. Now, on any trade, we know we could be wrong. So we have to put in a stop. By the way, this is a, a pattern I call buy at B, which I'm not going to discuss. And it's also an IPO. You can't see the rest of this first pullback. So let's just, just see it as a first pullback. And you can see that it didn't do a whole lot for a while, but then eventually it took off. And at that point, you took a piece of the pie. So when it got to 23, so again, entry here, 20, stop here, and then take partial profits here. So as you can see, it's as easy as pie. Well, is trading really always that easy? Of course not. But it's not nearly as difficult, easy for me to say, as many people often make it. And this is what inspired me last week to talk about money management. I was talking with a client, I think on maybe a Wednesday or even Thursday morning about the stock. And he had taken the trade. He bought the pie and he had a stop in place. So, so far so good but he decided to toss the pie and his reasoning was that the volume has become too light there is no more interest now if you go back and watch last week's show you'll notice that that was one of those those logical reasons for getting out of a trade and i'm, I'm going to start accumulating these so we could use them for future lessons so um if you're out there i'm not picking on you in particular and i don't want to throw um salt into your wounds, but I think it just makes for such a good teaching example uh, for others that I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to have to use you as an example. And I don't know if he actually exited the trade or not. I know he was contemplating it, so I feel maybe I'm, I'm hoping that he stayed with it. So what will happen is if he did decide to toss a pie, then he's going to have to say buy pie and watch the stock take off without him. Sooner or later in your career, I will guarantee you that you will micromanage yourself out of some really good trades and then watch the market take off without you. My answer to that is don't. Now, you have to resist that urge to micromanage a trade. And as I said last week, a lot of things that, that work in life don't work so well in trading. You can't control the situation. So a lot of times in trading, you just have to let things unfold. And sometimes that's tough. And here's the thing that you have to realize. There's always a reason to exit a trade. Always. Okay. No matter what trade you're in, there's always a reason to exit. Well, it's, a, it's, it's going against you. Why would you stay with the trade until you're stopped out as a full loss, like we talked about last week? The stock took off. You got a pretty good profit. How often do you get such a good profit? Maybe you should lock in that profit and something in between. There's always a reason to exit a trade. Maybe, maybe the market had a really big rally 
And the stock you're in just kind of sat there or actually might have went down a little bit. Okay. Logically, you're thinking that stock should go up. It, it probably should have gone up. But exiting the trade for that reason or for any other reason is not the thing to do. What's the thing to do? The thing to do, obviously, is just follow the plan. Now, there's always a reason to exit a trade, and there's rarely a reason to stay. Okay, unless it keeps going, unless it's just kind of grinding its way higher and grinding its way higher. But even then, you might be tempted to exit because you feel like, oh, I can't keep this up forever. Or or you wonder what's going to happen when those when those profits begin to erode. So there's rarely a reason to stay in a trade and always a reason to exit. So you have this. I guess dichotomy, for lack of a better word, where you're always, you have this little nagging voice in your head. Hey, the volume dried up. Market went up. Stock didn't go up. The stock is at a good run. How much further can it go? I'm losing a little bit. I don't want to lose any more. So there's always a reason to exit. And, and, and one thing that I thought about talking about today but I decided to kind of focus a little bit more on micromanagement is, and I think I probably talked about it enough last week. You get into a trade, you lose a little, then you get stopped at a full loss. You get into a trade, you lose a little, then you get stopped at a full loss. After that happens a few times, the next trade, it's going to be very difficult to follow that plan. So the reason that you might exit early on the next trade that could become the next big winner is because of your psyche, because you were so, stressed out over those other trades well the past does not have anything to do with the trade you're in but it does affect you that way and one thing i said once that really struck a chord with a client and it was boring a line from mark douglas when you have a loss on a trade it's not just that one loss you're feeling because if you're trading properly, it's not that big of a deal. If you're trading at 2% and you have an account dedicated for trading, 2% loss shouldn't stress you out that much. But the, the problem is, borrowing a line from du Douglas, Mark Douglas, the late, great Mark Douglas, is that you're not only feeling the stress of that loss, you're feeling the stress of every other loss prior. So it, it sort of magnifies the effect. Because if you think about it, one little loss is really no big deal, but if you think about all your prior losses, which you often will do, then it becomes a lot more stressful. Now, I left this in from last week. Little Tony's outside. My uh, Little Tony's a little rooster. Uh, he serves no purpose other than making noise. He just walked outside my office door. <laughs> so hopefully you can't hear him. We're going to have to lock those chickens up. Enough of this free range. Hey, little Tony. So regardless of your methodology, you must position yourself for limited losses and unlimited gains. And write that down. Now, I often say it's not my way or highway when it comes to trading. But I do strongly believe in what I'm doing, and I do strongly believe there are certain things that you must do to become a successful trader, regardless of your methodology, methodology. One of them is to limit your losses and allow for unlimited gains. So let's say you're trying to, you, you're doing a little system where you make a little, 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 and that's a so-called and hill strategy. And the reason is, is because ants can build a pretty substantial mound one little piece at a time. So on paper, that sounds pretty good. You've got this income producing machine. Unfortunately, one big footprint comes along and you're back to you're back to square one. And in some cases, you might be back to zero. So you might think, well, let me just go in and get some little crumbs. I could be like that little uh, the little sparrow flies in, gets a piece, flies off, flies in, gets a piece, flies off. And in theory, that sounds pretty good. And I think that's actually an analogy that was used in one of the market wizards. Unfortunately, something bad can always happen. And that something bad can wipe out many, many, many good trades. So you got to be really careful. And every now and then somebody will send me a system. If you think about sending me a system, 
please don't. Unless you want to pay me a lot of money and get prepared for me to rip you a new one, I'll be happy to do that. And then that'll be the best money you ever spent because it's going to be a hell of a lot cheaper than doing that in real time. Trust me, I've been around the block a few times. I've had, I have more war stories than I, than I care to admit. A lot of them are two or three drink minimums. But it, just trust me, I've been there, done there, done that, and have the T-shirt. So a lot of, but a lot of these systems that people send me are very ant hill in nature. They, they might be high percent correct, but then all of a sudden they get wiped out, and then the recovery time is real long. And one in particular I'm thinking of, I'm often picking on this poor guy. But he sent me something, and he's like, he had a 40-something percent drawdown, and it took about 30 trades to make that back. And he's like, yeah, but over a year's period, it was still profitable. Well, who's going to lose nearly half of their money and just calmly continue to trade that system? Very few people. OK, and if that was a system in, in the, and I can guarantee you if that was, system was actually being traded with with uh, OPM, other people's money, then most people will pull the plug on a drawdown that steep. So, again, I saved him a lot of heartache, hopefully, by pointing that out. So be very careful if you are looking at something that's a little bit anthill in nature. Now, getting back to my stuff, I know I kind of digress a little bit here. But getting back to my stuff is it's very important that you capture that occasional outlier. And if you micromanage yourself out of that trade, then you're not going to capture that important outlier. So amongst other problems, micromanagement will more than not likely prevent you from capturing the crucial longer term gains now i've told the story a few times i need i need some new antidotes maybe i need to get out more i'm going to vegas a couple times over the next few months to do some speaking out there I, I probably need to travel the world again kind of tap the brakes on everything with all the stuff going on in the world in my business here but i need to get out more and get some new stories but anyway in the meantime i'll tell some old stories i was in dallas a few years back speaking to a investment group over there and uh, Peter Mothy had invited me, and then afterwards he was giving me a little critique of the speech, which I which I welcome. And he pointed out, he goes, you make it sound too elusive because you use the word streaky. But it is a little streaky, and I don't know how, first of all, I don't know how to solve for that. If I knew how to solve for that, you'd never see my fat ass again. But just yesterday, a client was pointing out, Dave, I get it. You just need to catch the occasional big winner, and you'll do just fine. And, and that it, that's a secret. And it, it's um, I, I wish I could get more, but it seems like they just come along just at the right time to keep you in the game and do really well. And I can't quantify that. I can't explain it any further other than that's what it is. And, and I, I have a, an interview on a radio interview on Friday. And uh, one of the potential questions is what keeps you up at night? And maybe that's what keeps me up at night is like when is that next big winner going to come along? Because I don't know. And if you read uh, Montier and some of these uh, behavioral psychologists, when the information is uncertain is when it creates the most amount of stress. So that's one thing that keeps me up at night is worrying when those big winners come along. But I also, on the flip side, do have a confidence that they will, and through hard work and a lot of patience, we'll get to those. So as far as the micromanagement is concerned and micromanage yourself, micromanaging yourself out of these big winners, all you often have to do to avoid micromanagement is just is nothing, okay? There's nothing to do. If your stop has not been hit, do not exit. If your stop hasn't been hit, then don't quit. What if I could do that in a little Johnny Cochran? If your stop hasn't been hit, you must not quit. OK, <laughs> so if your stop hasn't been hit, then you must not quit. Uh, if you're up, if you're up just a little bit, you must not quit. So but a lot of people might feel like, oh, man, I got whacked on all those prior trades. Maybe I should lock this in. I got whacked pretty hard recently on some Forex stuff I was doing. And then I came in this morning, and had a big gain. And part of me was thinking, you know, just lock that in. And that kind of that kind of washes all those other trades away because if I stick with the open position, it might start eroding, and then my drawdown is then I'm still in a drawdown, and I'm like, no, this is not. I'm not playing to break even. I'm playing to win, and you should always play to win. 
I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going off at a tangent here. Imagine that. But you should always play to win. Never play not to lose. That's a losing strategy right there. Trying to mitigate losses when you're not stopped out, taking profits too soon. In other words, micromanaging is a playing not to lose strategy. We're here. We're in it to win it. Okay. And we're looking for those outliers. We're looking for those, and I, I hate to say it, those elusive moves that seem few and far between. But, again, they just seem to come along at the right time. So how do you do nothing? Okay. Well, that's fairly easy. Just make your screen look like the graphic that I have here. Turn off your screen. As I think I said last week or in the column, I forget where, but if watching every tick helped the market move in your favor, then I'd be the richest guy in Richtown, especially early in my career where I did watch every single tick. And as I often say, a lot of people think, well, if you quit your day job, you can become a better trader. Well, usually or quite often, just the opposite happens because you're trying to make something happen when there's nothing going on. Whereas the other way, you're busy saving lives and doing other great things, and then you let the market just do what it has to do. But getting back to the watch and tick things, I would watch every tick to where my eyes would hurt. And then if I went to the bathroom, I know a little TMI, but I would turn on this little beep thing. I forget the name of the feed I had back then. One of those old Ensign maybe. Well, anybody, anybody old enough to remember that? I think it was Ensign. It would beep, 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 you know. And an uptick was like, deet, and a downtick was like, man. So I would, this is disgusting, but I would leave the door open to the bathroom, and I would listen, you know, deet, 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 yay, ah, 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 oh, you know, and it was, it was a stressful life. And I realized that I was going to have to, to do something differently or I wouldn't survive. So you can't obsess over every tick. You have to have a bigger picture plan in place and just follow the plan and let things unfold. And a lot of times, again, all you have to do is nothing. You don't have to do anything, right? Just let it unfold. Turn off your screens if you have to. Uh, it is a game of outliers. I'm probably the last person in the United States that hasn't seen Game of Thrones. So we actually did, we actually started watching it uh, just recently, so I won't be the last one. But it is a game of outliers. And I just grabbed a snapshot this morning of the portfolio. And you'll see we have two decent winners in there, and the rest are losers. So these are the ones that we have been waiting for. Hopefully. And this is why I put a little question mark in here. Because so far, this one's pretty good. About $3,000 worth of gains. And notice down here, we don't have much more than $3,000 in the open portfolio. Now, I do leave these closed half open positions in here just to avoid the confusion. Because if I took these out, I'd get a lot of questions. So some people question that. But hopefully, that doesn't make a huge difference in the portfolio, provided that these keep going. And I don't mean to digress too far on that. But the bottom line is... You want to position yourself so you capture that occasional outlier. So closing in about 100% gain on that. So that's decent. Yeah, I know. I just said hope. <laughs> Every time I say hope, I need to put a quarter in a jar. A jar. Remember the, uh, the Bud Light Square Jar commercial? <laughs> After this presentation, Google it or YouTube it. It's pretty, uh, pretty damn funny. Anyway, so you can see without these outliers in here hopefully big outliers there's that word again let me put a quarter in a jar your performance is mediocre at best or possibly even negative so but what's going to happen i'm going to get an email from somebody dave hey i'm done with the service okay uh if you don't mind me asking because i want to make it better for everyone else what's what's wrong well i can't make any money well did you get cnx no i didn't take that one Okay, well, what about pie? No, I didn't take that one. 
Well, what did you do? Well, I took the CETX and I took the SXCP. And they turned into losers, so I just went ahead and got out. And I, I just can't make money with this. Well, okay. The problem is, barring a line from Greg Morris, is the sharpshooting. People tend to sharpshoot. So it's like, here are the setups. And then it's like, well, let me take, uh, I'll take this one and I'll take this one. And then I'm not going to take the rest of those. Well, the problem is one of these rests could turn into the next big winner. So, again, it's cliche, but you need to trade that plan. And first of all, you got to plan the trade, then trade the plan. And it's, it's, this is fodder for many, many other presentations, as I have spoken about in the past. But the reason most people don't plan the trade to begin with is because the moment you plan the trade, you admit that you could be wrong. And we don't like admitting that we could be wrong. You married guys can attest to that. Uh, your life gets a lot easier when you do, though. <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, so you resist. You must resist that urge to wing it. When you don't make a plan, you you just fail to admit that you could be wrong, and yet and you could be wrong on every trade, on any trade, I should say. So you must plan that trade, and then then you have to trade the plan and avoid the micromanagement. But as humans, we feel like we must do something. But sometimes that doing that doing something is detrimental. What's the old, it's like the alligator thing. Well, allegedly, if you get bit by an alligator, just go limp and he'll leave you alone. I don't know about that. But the more you fight, the worse it gets. That's kind of like an old saying. I, I doubt that's true. I'm not gonna, if an alligator shows up here, we had a neighbor had one. I hadn't had one on my property uh, yet. But I'm not going to test that theory. But the analogy does make some sense. Often by taking action, you make your life a lot worse, at least in the trading world. Whereas in life itself, maybe you need to take action or maybe even need to take more action. So as I said last week, a few things. No going in that you don't know. And I'm trying not to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. No one knows what a market will do. Not you, not me, and not the guy who screams on TV. So that's a huge release that we don't know what happens next. It's also very humbling. I woke up this morning thinking, geez, I've been at this 20-something years, and I have no idea what the market's going to do next. Well, I don't know exactly what it's going to do. I have an idea what it should do, and often it doesn't do what I want it to do, obviously. But it's amazing, and that's hard to get that far in your career and then have that kind of, uh, I don't know if I call it an epiphany, but it, it was an epiphany probably 10 years ago, like, hey, just give up trying to figure it all out and just follow along. But I can't imagine any other profession where you would have such an unknown at least every day, and, and how could you just continue to uh, perform? I mean, it's not like uh, – you know, you open up somebody and the heart's not where it's supposed to be one day or, or, you know, it's like, but that's trading. You don't know. But that's a release. The fact that no one knows and you're not competing against anyone else. You're just competing against yourself. So, as I said last week, accept a potential loss going into the trade. That's a cost of doing business. I, I And I know I'm guilty as charge. I get all pissed off when I see the funds eroding in an account. But as long as I have a stop in place and as long as I only risk a small percentage on the trade, 2% is, is the standard number, then so what? You have to kind of see it as a cost going in, accept and embrace that cost going in, and then your life gets easier. My wife's computer crashed. We had all our company books on there, her company, my company, uh, personal finances, and then, of course, uh, she didn't bother to tell me until yesterday 3,000 pictures <laughs> which luckily I recovered um, or re process of recovering but that's another story altogether but the point is I had to spring for another computer and it sucks okay and then we had to overnight it or two day it whatever uh, so it's a, it's another expense on top of that but you know what cost of doing business she's running two businesses on that computer or at least the books for two businesses and she needs it, so 
So be it, okay? Yeah, cuss and fuss and get aggravated, but it's not going to affect my life. I slept pretty well last night, and not once did I wake up thinking, oh, man, I had to buy a computer. So you have to view it as an expense or a cost going in. And I know it's easier said than done. It's easier said than done. And I think that's probably why, not to not to be egotistical, but that's probably why I'm good with explaining things on a psychological basis because I, I, I fight those same demons. I fight those same problems all the time. I struggle as a trader because I have all those emotions and I still have a pulse. But then what do I do? It's like, well, you know, it's kind of like, what would Dave Landry do? Like my wife often tells me, and I just, I just follow the plan. And amazingly, that was pretty easy. But then I find myself in that same kind of uh, trap once again. And then I have to just tap the brakes and say, wait a minute, what do I have to do? Do what has to be done. So accept that potential loss going in. That's a big one for me. That made my life a lot easier once I learned to do that. And you, you almost have to be kind of flippant about it, like, eh, so what? I could stop that, I could stop that. You still drop an F-bomb and move on, though. And just forget about it. Uh, again, turn your screens off if you have to. And I wrote a column about this a while back. It turned out to be one of my more popular columns. I probably need to bubble it back up to the front of the website. But on your next trade and only that trade, follow the plan. Now, I'm not... I haven't given out much tough love, and I probably need to start doing that a little bit more in case I get hit by a beer truck, as I often say. Because I've had people that have called me and emailed me for 10 and even maybe going on 20 years now, and they're still not successful. And, and I've nurtured them along, and that's probably not a good thing. I, I have, in more recent times, begin cutting people off, just like, look, you're not – you're just, you're not doing what I'm saying. Uh, you know, you haven't watched the course. So I need to just, you need to cut your losses. You don't want to go another 20 years doing this. But as far as a tough love is concerned, if you can't make one trade and follow the plan, provided that you have a little experience, then you might need to reevaluate your trading career. If you can't make the next trade and only the next trade and follow the plan, then you might need to reevaluate your trading plan. I had somebody email me a few weeks back. Travis, if you're in here, um, give me a shout out over there. I think he's in Texas. He said, you know what, Dave, you struck a chord with me on my next trade. I'm going to follow that plan. And after you do that, you prove that you could do it, then rinse and repeat on the next 10,000 trades. And I was talking to a client yesterday, and this is the, the, the guy I'm always talking about where we took out the day trades and he was actually successful. But if you put him back into the account, he failed miserably over a short period of time. And the fact that he actually took all of the trades and followed all of the plans to a T and was successful – proves that he could do it now the 20 or 20 something day trades i think it's like 20 day trades in one particular stock where he lost all this money that's he just has to eliminate that because that's not part of the plan anyway so you have to do something to get the reps in now if day trading is your plan that's fine and but just follow your plan doing that on your next trade and then after that rinse and repeat for the next 10,000 trades as I often say, trading done properly can be really boring because a lot of times there's nothing to do. And as I often say, I have a bit of a sickness. I've got to always be doing something. I have to always be moving. It drives my wife nuts. I'm not stupid enough to make the short trip joke. But even if she's watching TV and I watch TV with her or we watch a movie or whatever, my I'm shaking her foot. I'm moving around. I'm doing something. I have to I'll grab my laptop. So I check the emails or something. I feel like I always have to be doing something to a point where it's almost a sickness. And it's kind of interesting. I, I mentioned this a few times in these presentations and I've gotten a lot of emails from people like I got that, too. You know, <laughs> it's just the way I am. I'm very type A, eat fast, talk fast. It's, it's me. So I always have to be doing something. And if I am just watching a screen, I will take action. 
Okay. I'll, I'll drill down the five minute chart. I'll start day trading and I know me. So sometimes I'll just have to turn my screens off. Sometimes I have to walk away or even better. I just keep myself crazy busy. Okay. I have a to-do list. Every time I look at my to-do list, it gets longer, not shorter. So, you know, I guess, I guess if I ever get everything done, I'd be dead. Right. So it's a good that I have things to do, but I keep myself incredibly busy. So do some research, look at some charts, spend some time with a loved one or open up another business or grow another business or take care of some patients or whatever you do instead of trading when there is no opportunities and instead of micromanaging yourself out of the next trades. Uh, another big thing that I've talked about a tremendous amount of the last five years or so, and I can't emphasize this enough. Garbage in, garbage out is a very important concept. Back in my computer science days, that's what we used to, you know, that was a saying. Uh, if you if you build some crappy code, you get a crappy output, and that's just a fact of life. If you are trading on crappy stock that looks like electrocardiogram, you can't expect that stock to just start trading today in your favor nice and cleanly. You have to pick the best going in to begin with. And that's why I spend so much time in a stock selection course on how to do just that. And if you're not gonna if you're not gonna get the course as I said last week or week before if you're not going to get the course, then at the least go in and watch the hour and a half or hour video, whatever it is, on that stock selection page. And I'll give you the link in one second. At least watch that. And that's going to keep you from asking probably 95% of the, of the stock picks that have nothing to do with the methodology and certainly don't fit that you'll see often in these presentations and, and and we might even see a few in, in a couple of minutes. I don't want to scare anybody out of asking about a stock, but if we could use you as a teachable moment, as a learning example, then, then, then we will. So how's your stock pitch? Is it the best of the best? Are you picking the best, leaving the rest? And that's another cliche. And never forget again, garbage in, garbage out. Intuition or intuition. That's a, a stole that line from Market Wizards. So do you really think you have the greatest setup in setup town? When I do my scans, it's like I'm just banging on a little keyboard like the little rat trying to get his cocaine going after stuff. And the reason I say banging on the keyboard is I hit my space bar, and that's how I go from, from chart to chart to chart. You know, bam, 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 bam. And I go through charts sometimes that fast, and all of a sudden, wow, it's like it hits me over the head. It just jumps out at me when I see a good-looking setup. And after a while, it will with you too. It does take a little experience. I know the course will help, but you have, you're going to have to still get a little experience in. You're going to have to get some, uh, what's the word, some drive time in. And then also ask yourself, are the conditions conducive to your methodology? It has been a bit of a struggle over the last year and a half or so because the market has just kind of chopped it around and gone sideways. And it's been really a lot, a lot of work. We really had to really work at it. And luckily, we found, and again, here it comes, just enough of those outliers to make it all worthwhile. Matt says, hi, Dave. I've never understood why people don't like the word hope with trading. In a world of unknowns where nobody knows what will happen next, hope has always seemed like a very appropriate word to me. I hope every trade works the minute I enter. Well, yeah, the problem is, eh, like uh, quoting uh, Tom McClellan's drill sergeant, as in birth control, hope is not a strategy. And I think that that hope becomes a bad word when hope is a strategy in and of itself. So you have to, now I did meet, I, I was, I'm friends with the with a Russian trader, and he's very, uh, as, as sometimes Russians can be, uh, Andre, you in here, you probably can attest to what I'm saying. Uh, you guys are, seem to be a little more stern and can be tough and a little bit more uh, like, uh, like Vulcan in nature and very uh, serious and matter-of-fact about things. And his, uh, he was telling me when I was actually in Russia with him, uh, that 
he has no expectations on a trade. I'm not sure I could be that that cold. I, I think you have to have positive expectations, as Matt said. So from that standpoint, I think it's okay to hope things work out and be positive. I was going to be a pessimist. I figured it wouldn't work out. But I think it's okay to hope for a positive outcome, but don't make hope in and of itself your strategy. Again, hope as in birth control is not a strategy. So I think that's where we're coming from. Hope is not a strategy. All right, a few of you guys are agreeing on that. Um, these are kind of old announcements, but they're still current. Uh, website rollout continues. Let me know something you like, something you don't like on the website. Um, I ended up doing the design and everything on my own. Uh, I didn't set out to do that, but again, that sickness kind of rears its ugly head, and I had, <laughs> I felt like I had to do something before I knew it. I was kind of uh, ways deep in it, and I think it looks pretty good. But let me know if you if you think uh, it could use a little help or whatever. And and uh, I don't need any programmers at the moment, so no need to email me on that. Every time I say that, I get like a dozen emails. Ah, I'll take it over. It's like, well, okay. Um. I have some older content that I'm putting out, and that's showing up mostly on YouTube, but that will eventually make its way to the to the back end of the website. So keep an eye out for that on both the website and ideally on YouTube. Just go to YouTube first on that. And then uh, I'm still working on a beginner's course, and that's been really a lot more fun than I thought it would be. It's a lot more work than I thought it would be too. Uh, but that's it's coming out really, really good, and I'm pretty excited about it. And it's, it's like I'm going back in time to teach the guy 20-something years ago who thought he knew what he was doing, but maybe he, did, he didn't realize that the battle is often from within. And, and so without getting too esoteric and too kind of mamby-pamby or whatever the, the word is I'm looking for, I'm trying to introduce that psychology to the patterns, to the interaction, to the trading the plan and planning the trade to the money management, to make life a lot easier. And as soon as you fully embrace that psychology in that we're not made to trade, your life gets so much easier. So I'll be uh, rolling it out. Hopefully um, I have a target date of December. I'm sorry, September. Hopefully I win the Freudian slip. Any questions, uh, daviddavelander.com. Uh, Donald says, off topic, do they brew good beer at the craft brewery in Abita? Man, I shouldn't say this. I'm not a huge fan of the beta beers. I will drink them. Um, I had a friend of mine once said that that the beer that I brew is uh, much better than, than than their beers, and maybe I'm just kind of egotistical. Uh, they recently got bought out and they rolled out some new ones. Uh, there's a few beers that that I there's a few I haven't tried yet that people are absolutely nuts over. Like the wrought iron IPA is supposed to be phenomenal. And I'm not a huge hop head, so I haven't tried it yet. I'll probably get around to it. But I'd say they're decent. Uh, but uh, uh, as a brewer, it's, I, I kind of a little a little uh, biased toward my own stuff. <laughs> but it's good. It's decent beer. I don't think you're going to be disappointed, okay? And uh, so, again, just email me if you, if you have questions. And then I have so much content on my website. Um, so check it out. Again, uh, if you want to get started with the trading service, it's uh, you can get started at a low rate, or you can even follow along for free for a while. And I've actually had a few people that 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 have upgraded to real time because they told me they were actually doing okay following the delayed service, which was kind of a uh, kind of exciting for me. And then um, stock selection course between now and the end of the month, if you go to this link here. Uh, I'll give you one year of the service, and that's fourteen ninety seven on that. You'll save, so check that out. It's one thing to to say something in theory, as Yogi once said, in theory, theory practice is the same, and practice they are not. It's another to actually see something unfold in practice. So I could I could tell you what to do till I'm blue in the face, but until you actually see it unfold in the service, you're like, hey, this stuff really works. Doesn't always work. Okay, if it did, you'd never see my fat ass again. But it does work over time, and those big winners seem to come along just often enough. And again, I've got to figure out a way to 
and I hate to use the word spin, but spin that a little bit to make it a little bit more exciting and a little less elusive. Thoughts on TWLO, YRD, TLND, Dave, I can't be in the webinar due to business travel today, but I was hoping you could discuss these. Be happy to, John. And by the way, these uh, do go up on YouTube about two hours after I'm done. So let's go ahead and jump to the charts. Uh, we'll go through John's picks. I want to go through a few things in the overall market, and then um, we'll take a look at what, what your picks. Don't be, don't be. I won't beat you up too much if it's something that doesn't fit the methodology. Um, so don't worry about that. I know I said I would earlier. A little tough love. So John wants to know about TL, TWLO. This one looks pretty good. Uh, it's it's had a pretty good run in here, as you can see. IPO, big fan of IPOs. Okay. As you know, and you can see that it's recently taken off, accelerated higher. Now it's going to have to pull back a bit for me to go after it. So maybe you pull back to about 50. When you have a sharp run higher like this, you want to make sure that some people get knocked out on the correction. So the sharper the move higher, the bigger the run down. That's a pretty substantial run. This is almost a little too crazy to be trading, but... It's kind of on the cusp. I think it looks pretty good. These IPOs have been a little wild and crazy lately. So take that all into consideration. But I think on a pullback, maybe to about 50, it might be worth a shot. Uh, I think it's a little bit more dangerous to go after on a shallow pullback, although lately it seems like a lot of these, these IPOs aren't having much of a pullback. You also want to know about YRD. Uh, this one would have to pull back, obviously, because it's right at a brand new closing high. As you can see, decent trend, fairly persistent trend, and then now it has begun to accelerate higher. Uh, the HV is just borderline crazy on this one, though, so be careful with that because it could be a very wild, wild ride. Uh, maybe on a pullback. Let's just see what happens. Uh, if it keeps drifting higher like this and doesn't take out this high decisively, then uh, I might avoid it altogether, but if it pulls back over the next few days to a week, it might be worth a shot. So we'll know it when we see it. A little bit of a Potter Stewart, what's his name? Potter Stewart trade, TLND. We'll know it when we see it. Uh, this one I'm not so crazy about because it has a bit of that, what I call bottle rocket characteristic to it. It also made all its move on pretty much just this one day. And by Bottle Rocket, and I don't know if that's in the intro course or not, but I think it is uh, if you watch the video. If somebody does, somebody watches it, let me know. I don't have, to, I just like, I don't have enough time to go back and, and catalog everything sometimes. But Bottle Rocket is when something that goes, kind of takes off like a Bottle Rocket. To those of you who weren't from the South and uh, aren't rednecks, um, a Bottle Rocket is this little rocket you put in, literally into a bottle and you light it. When they take off, it's like, whoosh, they're going to go to the moon, but then they just fizzle out, and they're kind of boring once they, um, they hit Apogee. You know, pop, that's it. Nothing nothing much. So a bottle rocket in a stock is a stock that shoots straight up like this, and oftentimes what happens is they come straight back in. And you'll see me talk about this over and over again uh, when we get to these stocks that have just done just that. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. Uh, this will just take a few minutes, and then we'll hop out. Uh, if you want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. Hopefully, I didn't scare any, anybody away. I'm I'm fairly gentle. Don't worry about that. S&P 500. My concern here is that they have lost a little bit of steam as of late. You could see if we draw a horizontal line with this chart zoomed in, they're just kind of consolidating in here. That's that's okay because sometimes a market can adjust to new levels. So from, from a positive standpoint, that's a good thing. The only thing I don't like is that we did kind of wedge up in here. We had a little fake out yesterday, which was good, and now we're trading a little higher. So, so far, so good as far as that's concerned. There's always something to worry about. I'm sure if you, I'm not a big fan of oscillators, but I'm sure if you put some sort of oscillator down here, it would it would prove or show what I'm, uh, I'm just pulling out the air. Anybody have a favorite oscillator? What about stochastic? It would show the market kind of losing a little steam in here, but I wouldn't get too excited about that. Did it show up? Well, let's see. Oh, it's going to ask for parameters. Oh, here we go. 
yeah, see, you can see it kind of like topped out and looks a little, you know, but, uh, you know, I don't worry about that too much. I think uh, it's dangerous to try to trade an oscillator. So before I digress too far, let's just take a look at the, the blank chart again. But you can see that we have lost some steam in here. We did kind of wedge up. Yesterday's action sort of negates the wedge. But for me to get excited, this thing is going to have to break out again to new highs, not look back for a while, and then pull back. But there's always something to worry about. We're just off all-time highs. So let's not get too excited just yet unless we do come – let me just erase all this. Unless we come back below this – uh, consolidation in here, so 21.50. Unless we drop below 21.58, I think the market is okay. Uh, there's always something to worry about. Again, I prefer to see some acceleration higher, but it's hanging in there. NASDAQ uh, looks okay. It has, it's lost a little steam from this run that it had in here, but so far it's continuing to persist higher. So I don't want to pick it apart too much. And it's just off of all-time high, so so far so good. But as I've been saying, ad nauseum, I'd really like to see it clear this prior peak in here decisively and not look back for a while. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty's having an okay day so far today. Uh, pull back a little bit in here, kind of broke out, pull back a little bit, trying to thrust a little higher. As a general statement, it continues to push into this overhead supply, so that is a good thing. You know me, I like to see it just kind of bust through that overhead supply and not look back for a while, and then we'll get some pullbacks. That'd be fantastic. Uh, can I say hope in that? I guess it's okay to hope the market does something, uh, as long as that's not your strategy, right? Uh, a couple of areas losing steam in here, the REITs. We could see some short setting up in the REITs. I'm not a big fan of shorting something like the REITs or trading something like the REITs because they're low in volatility, but... It might be something that's worth trading. And I guess we'll know it when we see it. But as you can see, these moving averages are beginning to converge. And even if you didn't have the moving averages on a chart, you could just eyeball a chart and say, well, wait a minute. The net net change is uh, significantly lower. Oh, I have an example I want to show. I guess I'll wait a week because it's a live example. But, but somebody was asking about net net change about a stock and, and it had shorter term it looked pretty good shorter term or intermediate term it looked like this but they were concerned that the net net from like a long time ago like a year ago or six months ago was was back here but we're focused on the intermediate term first before we start looking way back in time to pick things apart and that'll make more sense next week but anyway reads are losing a little steam health services losing a little steam in here uh, I think we could see, start to see, if this market kind of grinds higher in here, we could start to see a little bit of a rolling correction where, and this is a little bit kind of, um, I don't want to say perverse, but kind of like the uh, counterintuitive might be the word I'm looking for, the phrase. But sometimes you'll get these high relative strain stocks, these momentum stocks, lose steam and begin to roll over. And the reason is they become a source of funds because these these um, big funds will go in and they'll take profits and, and that's the word that's where the source of funds comes from but they'll plow them back into the market and they'll buy something possibly that's at, at somewhat lower levels and that could be healthy for an overall market uh, as far as trading though it could be a little counterintuitive sometimes because you end up with with you're, you're doing the right thing by trading the momentum areas, and then what happens? They, they start losing steam on you. So that could be a little frustrating. Uh, I still like metals and mining. I know there are some concerns there. I know the valuations might be getting away. I was in a webinar on Monday. I think the valuations were getting away from the underlying commodities. Uh, I don't care, okay? And, and again, that, that just seems like fodder for micromanagement by interjecting that um, type of reasoning. Now, I don't want to pick on anyone. If, if that macroeconomic type of analysis is what you're using, then by all means use it. My problem with that kind of stuff is I don't see how you could time off of that. And the old, uh, I think it's Keynes quotes, comes to mind. 
markets can stay irrational a lot longer than you could stay solvent. So this gentleman was talking about how the metals are a possible short. And his reasoning makes a lot of sense to me because the metals have gotten too far away from their underlying commodity based on his research. In other words, the gold stocks, for instance, are trading at 200 percent or have made a 200 percent run, even though gold only went up a little uh, on a percentage basis. Well, that doesn't bother me as a trend follower. And that's how I got the name trend following moron is by not confusing the issue with facts. And what did we just talk about for the last half hour and then I wrote about last week and then we did last week's show on is that micromanagement, you're confusing the issue with facts. There's always going to be a reason. I said there's always going to be a reason to exit trade. There's always going to be a reason not to take a good trade if you interject too much logic and reasoning into that trade. Okay. But. What is is metals are kind of hanging in there just off of these multi-year highs. So far, so good. We had a first thrust back here. We had a bow tie back here. And so far, so good. Uh, we're doing some longer term trend following and, and something like CNX, which I guess is a coal stock. We had the first thrust, the bow tie back here. And so far, so good. We're in longer term trend following mode on that one. Knock on wood. Should I do that? Ow, it hurts my head. Um, so... Metals and mining still looks pretty good overall. Uh, we do have a couple on our radar, a couple in the portfolio. So I think opportunities are still there. Gold stocks have been kind of a little elusive. And as I pointed out, they kind of took off and then they drifted and they took off, then they imploded, then they took off again. So really tough. This is kind of the uh, epiphany. Epiphany? No. Uh, what word am I looking for? It's on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, it reminds me of the Covell thing about trend following with the bouncing Bronco, like just always trying to uh, epitomize this might, might be the word I'm looking for. This epitomizes the tough trend following thing that Covell points out. Metal stocks, especially gold and silver, I can do that. But silver is actually a lot cleaner than gold, which is unusual, but it's pretty darn clean. So we just need a decent pullback here. And there are a couple of stocks that are on my radar in the silvers. Uh, that you might want to keep an eye on. There's not that many, so just keep an eye on all of them. Uh, other than that, a few areas like the foods, you know, took off, came back in, now they're trying to go back up again. But from, for the most part, most areas at or near new highs, most areas looking pretty good. The rally is fairly broad based, so I wouldn't pick apart too many things. Okay, uh, let's uh, jump into the individual stocks. Uh, just uh, take a quick look at USO, which is uh, uh, oil. And... I've, as I think I said last week, and I've been saying in, in my trading service, we obviously had the bottom earlier this year. And sometimes these commodities, especially oil and gold, can be more of a process than an event type of bottom. And in this particular case, it could be like a year-long process of bottoming. And it looked like we wanted to come down and test the prior lows, but then it turned right back around. As I've discussed before, maybe take a look at a weekly. Sometimes with a double bottom, you get a higher low on the second one, or they undercut the prior bottom and then reverse. Uh, rarely do you get like a perfect double bottom, and that's the danger of just studying classical technical analysis and trying to apply it. In the real world, it doesn't always unfold. But so far, it looks like, looks like oil is coming back in here. Uh, you know, I like to see it make some new marginal highs and keep on going. But I haven't completely ca counted out the energy stocks. In fact, if you take a look at the energy stocks, they're actually looking a little bit better than the metals. They're actually breaking out to new highs in here. Maybe that's why a little coal stock in a portfolio is doing okay so far. Okay. Now, there might not be any good reason for this, but what is is okay i uh, got one question and then uh we got uh, let's go ahead and get to the stock picks um just keep keep them flowing in the stock picks um in pullbacks what characteristics do you look for to distinguish a shallow one from a deep one uh that's kind of a long answer but the quick answer on that is maybe let's go back to one of these ipos um you the main the quick answer on that is you look at the magnitude of the prior move and the pullback has to be within the magnitude of the prior move or taking and taken in light of the prior move. So when you have a huge move higher like this, 
you want to make sure you have a pretty big knockout move back down. You want to have a pretty big correction from that extreme overbought condition. Okay, that's the quick answer. Um, the the stock selection course. I'm not trying to soft sell. Trust me, but uh, but if it works, that's fine too. <laughs> uh, we spent 14 hours just talking on talking about how to pick stocks. So there's a little bit more to it than that. But the quick answer to your question, again, not enough time to get into today, but yes, if you have a big move higher, then you want a pretty good knockout. And, I, and I'll keep that question in mind as we go through a few of the uh, pullbacks. Uh, AIRG, okay, let's take a look at that one. A AIRG. Did, uh, by the way, did anyone have any trouble getting in today? I know we've, we've had some uh, problems with links. Uh, this is an IPO, uh, Air Gain. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. What's the rule with IPOs? We do not trade any IPO until it's been out for more than five days. So I uh, can't give away the pattern, but yeah, Donald, good eye. This would actually be a buy setup going into tomorrow on that one, okay? All right, quiet bunch today. All right, no trouble today. <laughs> Thank you, Alan, I appreciate that. Okay, uh, individual stocks. I hope I didn't scare you guys away on that. Uh, Alan wants to know about YW. YW. Okay. YW? Y, YW. Okay. Uh, hmm. Could it be WY? Y, w. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Braid fart. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> it's about to say. Uh, Okay, CDE for Andre. Andre is my Russian friend. Uh, I hope I didn't pick on you Russians too much earlier, but you guys are a little, uh, can be kind of tough, stern. Yeah, this one looks really good. Um, you know, on some of these silvers, I hate to say it, but it's almost like you need to close your eyes and buy and forget about them. <laughs> forget about my methodology in silver and gold. Just buy some, forget about it, let it go, right? Um this is one that's on my list. I just want to see a little bit more knockout. Don was asking earlier how much knockout you want. Depends on the magnitude of the move. It's had a pretty good move in here. You don't want the knockout to come back to a prior base, a prior breakout, or a prior pullback, okay? So if you had a stock that looked like this, and again, I think if you watch that intro course on the stock selection, you'll see what I mean. You don't want something that comes back like that to the prior pullback. That's not too much of a problem here if we had just a little bit more pullback because it's had a pretty good run. So I like that one, Andre. Good eye on that one. If you're long, stay long, trail your stop higher, enjoy the ride. Um, if not, I'd sure would like a little bit deeper pullback. And I have to admit, my looking for a little bit more perfection in stocks, it has been a good thing, but I have to admit in the gold stocks and silver stocks, I've been missing the boat on some of these uh, plays here. And, it, and it's been kind of um, – frustrating uh goro i like i think goro's on the landry list today i probably should look at my landry list and see um i'd almost like again a tiny bit more knockout on this but yeah put this one on your watch list and keep this one on your watch list it looks pretty good i mean you could you could almost i'm on the cusp of saying go for it on this one uh although i'd like a tiny bit more knockout okay and, and again as i said earlier you don't want to pull back uh, to answer Dino's question, you don't want it to come back below this prior little breakout, below this prior pullback in here, but it does look pretty good. And it's like if it just had a tiny bit more knockout, I think I'd be all over this one. It has a bit of a double top knockout look to it. A double top knockout is when you have a, like a little peak and then you have another little tiny peak and then you have like a knockout move afterwards, something like that. Okay. You see a tiny little peak in here and then a knockout move. So, Again, that one looks pretty darn good. I'd almost give you a high five on that one, Andre. Andre, you, your stock picking is getting much better. Or you're just showing me the one. Ah, wait a minute. <laughs> I spoke too soon. Yeah, this one's too sideways. Uh, the net-net thing. Now, this is the question. Uh, as I said earlier, I wanted to point out some of these net-net issues. You can see this stock is right around. Let's just do a little measurement on this, Okay. So, like, as of yesterday, it's at a 1.53% change, stock with an HV of 85. So that's nothing. That's just a, that's just a few ticks. That's, that's the spread on this stock, okay? Um, so it would have to break out and not look back for a while and then come back in to uh, pull back. 
But yeah, first pullback after base, base breakout. Donald Ann's your question. You get a base breakout like this. You you want your first pullback is a great place to look to trade. I don't know if it'll let me draw a line in this direction. It won't let me do it. Uh, but yeah, a little pullback after a base breakout. By all means, have this one on your list. In fact, have all the golds and silvers on your list. As it looks like Andre does. Easy PW. Sounds like easy peasy, huh? Easy PW. Uh, this is a retail stock. I could see a little bit of a net net problem here. Um, because where is it now? Where was it? This is at 10 now. It's at 975, not too long ago. So it would actually have to continue to break out and then first pull back. What did I just say? First pull back at the base breakout. So, yeah, put it on your watch list. Not ready yet. VRX for Mr. Gary. Um, this is one we've obviously talked about in the past. Uh, I don't like this big down uh, implosion back here, and it does have a little overhead supply, but it's trading at 28 bucks. So I'm going to say two things, and, and I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth. First, markets have long memories, so this is still a little bit of a problem. But second, the longer you go forward, the more those memories begin to uh, evaporate. Boy, I, I cannot, I am not eloquent today. I don't know why I can't find the words I'm looking for. But what happens when you trade sideways for a long time like this at low levels, people who bought in this area here begin to throw in the towel. Um, people unfortunately die. And their estates get settled, so those stock that stock gets gets sold out. So this uh, consolidation in here, th this the old supply gets consumed. Now everybody's gonna say, well, how much? How long? It's like, well, it, that depends. And there's a lot. There's a long, long-winded answer on overhead supply, and again, it, it comes back to the stock picking on how far back it is, how wide it is, how long it is. There's a lot of things that go into the overhead supply. But looking at this one now, and I know we've talked about this one in the past, this overhead supply is a ways back. It's way back in 2015, early 2016. Uh, so it's not as big of a worry, and it's also pretty far ways up. Now, let's get back to the setup. Uh, it is a bit of a bow tie, but if you zoom in just a little bit, it still has some issues here. I, I'm going to go ahead. I'm still going to pass on this one um, upon further analysis in light of maybe something a little better. I, I hear you. I think it's bottomed out, and maybe I'm picking apart this stock too much. But I think I hear you. It's bottomed out. It looks okay. It's bumping up against a little bit of supply in here. You know, maybe if it got past 40, believe it or not, and then pulled back, it might be worth a shot. Kind of a big picture saucer and handle big picture cup and handle type of pattern but i think it would pass i mean it's not horrible but anytime i find myself saying well it's got this and it's got that it's got this when i start doing the jackie mason thing when looking at a stock when that goes on in my head then i realize that well, wait a minute this is not this is not a stock that jumped out at me and says yes this is what i want this is the trade i'm going to make this is the stock i'm going to trade tomorrow that's how it should be. You shouldn't have to pick it apart like I just did. And if you find yourself going through all that, then find something else. Now, that's not micromanagement. That is just obsessing before you get into a trade and not afterwards. Micromanaging only occurs after you get into a trade, and hopefully it does not occur. You resist the urge to do that. OSB pullback 8.4% after 34% run. Too many days. So let's take a look at that. OSB, and that's from Mr. Eric. Eric, good to see you in here. A O S B. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, notice the volume though. Okay. Super, super, super low. What do they make? They make OSB. Hence the name. Uh, too low to be trading. But let's just talk about it from an academic standpoint. It's got a lot of bad memories back here. Uh, one problem 
let me just point out something that that I never really thought about. I mean, I kind of thought about it from an empirical standpoint, but I never really thought about it from a from an in practice standpoint. But it, as I think it was Greg Morris pointed out once, technical analysis only actually works if you have enough players, and I don't know exactly how he said it, but you almost need a representative sample for technical analysis to work. So let me maybe rephrase that or, or, or try to explain it a different way. You have to have enough people in or interested in a stock or any other market so it can adhere to the general – what am I looking for? I have no words today for some reason. But you, you need you need a representative sample of people of of emotions and and the psycho for the psychology of technical analysis to work. So it's one thing you have to realize if you're trading something really really thin, then you're not going to have that sample. And another way to look at it, or just as one example of what could happen, is one big trader. I mean, this thing traded what is that? 1,100 shares today. 1100 shares today so let's say some trader comes in and, and trades 5,000 shares well that's five times the volume that we had already today so that's not necessarily going to work out with with technical analysis because he could push that market around now as far as your question let's assume this was a higher volume stock yeah that would be an okay pullback uh, is it too many days let's see one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and eleven yeah it's a little too many few few many days for my taste, but it does look okay. I mean, other than the fact that it's way too thin to be trading. Okay. Trick question on OSB. It's trading on Toronto, 250k over 50-day moving average. Oh, okay. So it's plenty, plenty of. Uh, okay, so it's got plenty of volume. All right. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, I mean that's the tricky part. It's like if you get into some of these crazy ETFs. Um, could somebody like think of one? Is a corn one of them? C O R N. Well, that's not a perfect example. Uh, somebody have an example of like an ETF? Let me see what ETFs. Uh, some of these ETFs are like really thin, but they're backed by like uh, huge commodities, and so there's going to be an arbitration that's going to keep them in line. So that particular stock, uh, I just talked about how thin it was, but it's actually trades on another exchange. So Sometimes the world's a complex place, uh, but still, I would I would shy away from it just because of the volume here. Maybe trading on the uh, Toronto exchange. P S T G overhead supply issues. P S T G. Don is Don is going to get the uh, you're going to get the the stock uh, selection course one uh, one stock at a time. There you go. Uh, yeah, uh, you answered your own question. Uh, I tend to be slightly less or slightly more lenient when it comes to a lot of these concepts with IPOs. So I don't worry as much about overhead supply. Um, I don't worry that like we have one in the portfolio now or in the, in the setups for today, where if you look at where the peak was recently and the peak was when it came out, they're about the same over like a year. So net net, yeah, it's unchanged, but then over the short term, it's made a good run. So I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to IPOs. But in this particular case, you do have quite a bit of overhead supply here. So for me to get excited about this, it would actually have to bust through that. Okay. But yeah, it looks pretty good. It's worked its way higher in a fairly persistent manner, but now it's getting ready to run into trouble. So leave it alone. CECO for Andre. That sounds like an educational stock. Uh, educational stocks can 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 be kind of choppy. Uh, notice longer term, it's kind of all over the place. EDU is like another one. It's just all over the place usually. Um, but getting back to the Kiko, Kiko, uh, it didn't really break out too much from this little base here. It's just kind of basing along. You know, maybe it's a Darva stock, you know, make a base, 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 make a base. So it's it's certainly working its way higher, but it's not setting up in a fashion that I would like to trade. So if you're long, stay long. Hey, Dave, what do you think about uh, NTLA for Susie? Let's see, NTLA. Um. 
this one's kind of getting its act back together. And here's a case, again, remember I just said the a um, little bit more lenient with IPOs, okay? So in this particular case, uh, yeah, I think it could be possible. Um, I mean, in an ideal world, I'd like to see like another big update before it pulls back, but uh, you can't always get what you want. You can't have everything. If you did, where would you put it? But yeah, maybe you know, if, maybe if it took out this low on a pullback, it's like I'd like to see a lower low and a lower high. Uh, but yeah, you definitely have a bow tie in the works. I would I would certainly put this one on your uh, watch list. Yeah, it does have a little problems, some problems in here, but it's not enough to worry about too much. So that's one case where I would make an exception for the overhead supply, prior peak, et cetera, type of issue. So good eye on that one. Uh, absolutely, have that on your watch list. ACIA. LN IPOs, okay. Yeah, ACIA was one that, that's kind of the fish that got away. We made a little bit of money in this one back here, and then it took off. I know some of my clients, whether they were following the plan or not, um, held on. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's one of these makes you year, right? Uh, but I don't want to get too stressed out over shoulda, coulda, woulda. At least we made something on the trade. Uh, but now it's gone too crazy. HV 107 now, I mean, maybe on a pullback, but I think at this point in time, it's just gone too crazy. Uh, to those of you who are on the service, by the way, I did a write up, uh, in the comment section on the service page. Uh, I, I, it, because I've been answering all these emails personally for so many years, it's like all this content just comes and goes and just all evaporates. So what I started doing about, uh, several months ago was if I could ask the question, I answer it down in the comment section, and we're building some really good content there, uh, and it's going to turn into the mother of all, uh, what do you call it, fact page, FAQ, frequently asked questions. So uh, to those of you on the service, read about the, uh, somebody was asking about trailing a stop on this one, uh, so I did a, a little write-up there, so check that out. And uh, the, comment, the comments do not update on the, uh, it's too much, um, duplication of work the comments do not update on the delayed service so that's one thing that you will get uh with the live service is you get the live comments but you could you could get the uh you can get the trial service then you get you can see every comment that was ever made over the past uh, several months and you could just you could just copy those if you want them okay aci is a trade of the year two positions 170 percent and 216 percent oh good for you congratulations yeah, I mean that's the that's the type of thing that's possible in IPOs, you know, and that's why I'm such a big fan of the IPOs. I like this LN. I've been watching this one uh, quite a bit, and uh, you know, I talk about I talk about in IPOs. You have the you have the fly, and then the die pattern. They they take they take off fly and then die. Watch the um, if you go on my website under IPOs, you'll see the uh, there's a video on that where I talk about the fly and the die. And then also, I've been uploading a bunch of videos from 2014. I did a whole bunch of videos on IPOs back on. Uh, so check out YouTube. It's it's going to be Dave Landry's The Weekend Charts, and most of them will have the word classic in them. And then there's a few that that don't have classic that are from 2014. So look at those old ones on YouTube. But if you go to my website, I talked about. Here's where I'm going with this. I talked a lot about the fly and the die pattern. Uh, but one thing I, I, I sort of left out was kind of like the die pattern and then the fly again, meaning that they just drop like a stone, they get their act together, then they begin to take off. So that's something that uh, whenever I do an update on the IPO course, I'm probably going to uh, include something uh, to, do, to do with that. And any, any course that I ever do, if you buy it once, you get to come to every live session uh, from now on, or if I record a session, you get every session there. So I will, um, it might take me a few years, but I will eventually update all the uh, courses again. So if you go to the IPO course here, there should be a video in the middle of the page. So watch that for all, for those different patterns I'm talking about, the fly and the die. See, here's the, here's an example of the fly and then the die out afterwards. And then if you watch this video, it should be right there. This is a good, uh, if I say so myself, this is a good getting started video on IPO. So at the least, make sure you do that. 
people often say, uh, you don't have to pay me. What's what's the old saying? That that video is free and it's good. So people say Dave's good for nothing. You see that? Uh, this one looks fantastic. A little bit. I like a little bit more of a pullback here. Um, one of my rules with IPOs for breakout type of patterns is they must be below twenty dollars a share. And that's just something I've discovered empirically. I might change that rule if we get into a rip roaring bull market and the IPO bull market continues. But for now, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sticking roughly to that rule. I think COTV was one that was on the cusp of that, that uh, some of you guys were playing, and congratulations on that. So we might bend that rule a little bit. But in this particular case, I'd actually like to see a little bit more pullback. And I'm not so worried about this trading back here. Again, I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to IPOs for a variety of reasons. I don't know if we have enough time to go into them. But, like, here's the thing, too. you got to realize that people might have sold out early on just trying to flip it out or, or got uh, pissed off, for lack of a, a better way of saying that, and just bailed out on this IPO early on. So this is not enough to really worry about back here. And, again, that's one problem with IPOs, or as, as I often say, you do have a limited trading history, so it is a little bit tougher, and you have to bend the rules a little bit. But in this particular case, I actually want to see a little bit more pullback, maybe to 40, let's say somewhere below 43, maybe 43 and 44, 43 and a half would be good. Break the CDE. We talked about that one. That's going to be another minor. Yeah, we talked about that one. Uh, maybe a little deeper pullback. Uh, wheat. Wheat might be a good example. Wheat. Oh, that's funny. Like wheat. Yeah, it's super, 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 super thin. But in some cases, a fairly thin ETF. I mean, if you're, if you're, a, um, I knew a fund manager. Well, it's Greg Morris, in fact. Or in some of these, I don't know about something this thin, but on something that's really thin, you could actually call the market maker, and they can make a market for a tremendous amount of size for you. They could actually make it for you. Uh, so there is, there is a volume that's not necessarily represented in the actual ETF. Uh, something like this you probably want to, as a general statement, avoid. But maybe the copper one or one of those other ones might be one that, that seems a little thin, but it's backed by the copper market, which is incredibly thick. Let's see. Is it JJC? That's an ETN. Be careful with ETNs. ETNs are kind of a fake thing. Exchange-traded notes. I think that's what they call it, right? Um. But yeah, it's fairly thin, only forty thousand on average. But it's it's copper, okay? So the copper market's pretty thick. There's, I I would imagine the arbitrage would keep it in line. R E N R E N. Yeah, this is one I've been watching. This is a, a sweet little stock. Uh, kind of got crazy though. H V one sixty six. A little too much for my taste. I think this was on a Landry list not too long ago. Um, I would have preferred if it had um, not just one or two big updates in here and the gap and all, but uh, it's too crazy now. So let's let's just pass on that one. Even if it does pull back, HV at 166, too crazy. I recently purchased your IPO course and I'm still working through it. Love it. Money well spent. Love the course. Oh, thank you, Donald. That's awesome, man. Appreciate it. By the way, on those courses, I have lifetime support. That doesn't mean call me up and say, hey, let's build the trading system, Dave. <laughs> but what it does mean is, hey, let's take a look at this IPO. I'm, I have some questions on it. And just be prepared to do the work. I might say, you know, you need to reroute your course. You totally missed it. And I'll point you where to look. I'll point you in the right direction, I should say. But I do have unlimited, uh, within reason, of course, support on those. I mean, if it's to the point where it's it's uh, six hours a day, then you might just have to hire me. Thank you for that example and that uh, wheat, by the way. And thank you for that comment, Donald. Appreciate that. Um, by the way, I'm, I am a little housekeeping. I'm a little backed up in emails. Uh, uh, that spreadsheet I showed earlier, I wanted to mention this earlier. I do make that available, the, the raw spreadsheet. It's an older version. So if you want to track your trades, uh, I've, I've built all the formulas for you, and I do give that out. I know after last week's show, I got a few requests for it. I had some trouble with attachments, which has since been resolved. So uh, I'm a little behind on email, so my apologies on that. 
Um, also, the reason I'm thinking of that is somebody had an older IPO course and they wanted to get the new system. So if you did get the older IPO course, it's the same course that's in the new system, but you'll need a, a log on for the new system. So uh, make sure you, uh, and, and that's something that over a period of months, I, I'd mention that to everyone, but a few people uh, weren't aware of that. So yeah, you'll need a new log on. So as far as emails, if, if uh, you haven't got your new log on again, I'll, I'll get to your emails, or if you want to send me another email to remind me. Um, this one's a little too many days at the pullback. Um, it, it sure looks like it wants to go higher, maybe like a two-day chart or a three-day chart. It would look pretty good, or a four-day chart. Kind of a, it's kind of a weekly, maybe a weekly. It's kind of like a weekly, weekly TKO. It's only weekly leaks. Um, but as far as on a daily chart, it's just too many days in the pullback. I think I would pass on this one. This is this is one where I almost have to say, well, would I be a little bit more lenient and say it's worthwhile because it's an IPO? And I'm kind of on the cusp of saying, let's not worry so much about these these days in here. So I think it looks okay. Um, it, it's not jumping out at me as a great setup. I, I personally wouldn't take it, but if you, I think you could do much worse. You know, maybe get a, a fairly liberal entry on that one. It looks okay. I, you know, within the IPOs, I think we could find something a little better. But you certainly could do a lot worse. A M R N A M R N A M R N. My only problem here is it just kind of shot higher over a few days, and then you had gap down. So I would avoid it because of this gap down. Maybe I'm too picky, but I don't like that uh, gap down. And then it's got just longer terms kind of all over the place. But I think you can find something better. Um, I see it's an ADS. I don't know if that or PLC ADS means it's a what, uh, foreign. So maybe that's part of the problem here. But it, it just seems like you have to pick it apart too much. Uh, I mean, you certainly could do much worse. It's definitely is broken out and pulled back. So it's definitely headed in the right direction. REN, R-E-N. Uh, yeah, we talked about that one. We talked about that one. I forgot to delete it. Ring. RNG. Oops. Almost to the end. Yeah, these are gold miners. Um, so it's an ETF. Not a huge fan of ETFs, but it's uh, sometimes an ETF can kind of get you into markets that are difficult to get into. Uh, by their own right, it might be kind of hard to go out and trade these global uh, gold shares. So that's one reason to occasionally use the ETF. But for me to get excited, it would have to break out and then pull back. But good eye on that. I mean, that's kind of a that's, – there's your Darvis stock again, kind of making bases on top of bases. If you're long, stay long. But if you're not long, see if it could break out one more time and then look to play the pullback. But that does look pretty interesting. Yes, uh, Jim says it's meat too much of a pullback. Yes, meat was on the Landry list a couple days ago. And this is one, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up, Jim, because this is one that I wanted to talk about. If you go back and watch, I think it was in April or May, or maybe sometimes more recently. But anyway, I did I did uh, a week of charts where I talked about the beauty of the TKO. And this was one of those textbook setups where it was beautiful because you enter right here and your stop goes down here. And I meant to talk about this today. It just wasn't enough time. So I'm glad you brought it up. The beauty is if it doesn't trigger, you miss a losing trade. Now, it's very hard to quantify, and I need to figure out a way to, to explain this better. But if you have a pattern that helps you to avoid stinkers, losing trades, that – goes a long ways to making you successful. Well, it's hard to quantify because it's it's kind of seems like hypothetical, like, well, we missed a losing trade. That's a good thing. But if you actually took that losing trade, it would really, you'd be a hurt and pop, okay? But yeah, it's, I got to find a better way to, to talk about that or quantify it. But you can see that it kind of imploded in here. But in this particular case, the, the knockout move was pretty extreme, was on the cusp of being too much. But the beauty is when they're almost too much like this, if you can't decide whether whether to take them or not, take them and then have your entry above that high. And if it comes all the way back up and hits that entry, then you might have the mother of all reversals and trend 
resumptions on your hands. And if it doesn't, then you avoid losing trade. So if they're ever there on the cusp, I tend to err on the side of giving them a shot. But now a little bit too much uh, in this retracement. You can see you had this leg up here and then now you're all the way to right there. That's a little too far for my taste when it comes to IPOs. This looks like a bona, more like a bona fide reversal down now, like a first thrust down than it does just a uh, pullback. So stay away from that one. All right, Art, last one. E-X-E-L. Um, my only problem here is your breakout is one bar. You got this big gap, you break out in one bar. So for me, I'd, I'd like to see it trade higher longer term and then look to trade pullbacks along the way. But certainly, you know, boy, stocks today have been really good. Uh, you guys uh, picked some really good stocks, and, and hopefully I didn't pick on the beginners too much or scare the beginners away from, from picking mediocre stocks. But uh, stock picking was phenomenal today. So uh, hats off to you guys for that. Uh, we're at the bottom of the hour, so I need to wrap things up so we keep the uh, recording in line. But uh, any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLandry.com. I'll either answer you directly or if it's something that can become fodder for the next week's show or requires a lot of thought, I'll put it in the next week's show. But uh, if uh, no questions for you now on the weekend, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And I hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.